Solomon was, so was king. It was absolutism, in effect, that he was, he was describing. Locke takes the other approach, and uh, he says that life in the state of nature wasn't so bad, that it included such, such qualities as equality among people, and that people in the state of nature came together, made a contract with themselves to form a government um, in order to extend their rights, and in order to protect their rights from the few people who, were, who would, uh, would trample them otherwise. So Locke's much more upbeat about human nature, and he's much more upbeat about self-government. Uh, you can draw a pretty straight line from John Locke to the Declaration of Independence. I think even Thomas Jefferson might agree that Locke had more to do with that document than, than he did. Um, so when we talk about the time here about the 18th century, we're talking about the idea of people who might have signed the Declaration of Independence and their sort of thinking at, let's say, the close of the 18th century. And they would say that slavery, following again from this, the thinking that comes to us from, from the Enlightenment, slavery didn't really make a lot of sense. Right? It didn't make a lot of sense because it was not irrational. The, the prime point is it's not rational. It's not rational because it's not based on mutual consent. It's based on coercion. And things that are irrational just can't work in the long run. Now, to be real specific about why it wouldn't work, they would have pointed to these, these features. Uh, there aren't that many crops that are appropriate for slave labor at this time. And you only have to look at what was being grown in the United States at this time to see. Um, you could grow tobacco. Cotton, uh, tobacco was being grown uh, with slave labor at this point. Uh, rice, sugar was being grown, and a, a kind of cotton called long staple cotton. All of that was grown in a fairly circumscribed area, basically, in the Chesapeake region, as well as uh, further south in South Carolina. And, and that, was, that was about it. There wasn't a lot of slavery, uh, a lot of agricultural slave labor in Pennsylvania. Places where we had, we had winter didn't turn out to work very well, it seemed, uh, for slave labor, because, well, what do you do on a farm during the winter? Not all that much. So, as you suggested, you're much better off with subsistence wage labor that you can hire and, and fire when, when you're ready. Uh, it's just going to work a lot better. Uh, and indeed, to the extent that there was industry, they were finding that to be true, too. Uh, and that's a big argument uh, that the pro-slavery forces will make later, that slavery is kinder. It's actually, um, it's actually less exploitive. Slave labor is actually less exploitive than, than that kind of subsistence wage, wage labor. But that's, that's for another time. The idea in the 18th century was that slavery only continued because slavery already existed. That is, in Jefferson's words, again, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can either hold him nor safely let him go. They didn't know what to do. Uh, Jefferson would have said, slavery is doomed, uh, but we don't know how to stop it. We just don't, we just don't know how to, how to turn it off yet. Uh, it's not our fault that we have it because um, the, the English really imposed it on us. That's a little, little bit of a canard, but they, they did seem to believe that. Uh, the demography story is an interesting one, interesting part, worth, worth considering, um, since this is a demography class. If slavery is confined only to the areas where you can grow crops that are suited to slave labor, then as the slave population increases, as it was observed to be doing in the U.S., uh, recall that the U.S. has a, has, a, has a natural increase of slave population, which is quite unusual historically, uh, but, but it's definitely observed. So if that's going to happen, well then, over time, you've got a fixed amount of land, and you have more and more slaves to work it, they're going to become less and less efficient. Ultimately, there's an optimal ratio of labor to land, and if slave, slave population simply keeps growing, it's going to exceed that. And uh, efficiency is going to fall. Eventually, it's going to fall so far that you'll have too many slaves, and it will cost you too much money to feed them uh, for the labor that you can, can get out of them. So there's a demographic argument that, that dooms it. Uh, it comes down to basically that. If you don't let slavery grow geographically, it's going to die. And that was the, that was the, the attitude, and I think that's the, the belief that allowed uh, people who held this view that slavery was bad, but that it was doomed. But that's kind of what's going on in their mind when they, when they accepted compromises in, in the U.S. Constitution about slavery, which we'll have occasion to talk about later. So any questions then about this Enlightenment view, Enlightenment-inspired view of slavery? Uh, in their view, I think they would have come down on the side of wage, Philip, Philip and his wage slavery was a better idea. They would not have thought slavery could have existed then. They certainly wouldn't think it would exist now. So it's interesting that many of us came, up, came to the opposite conclusion, because in fact that's the conclusion of more, of more or less a consensus of historians today, that slavery really wasn't, in fact, doomed as the 18th century thought, uh, thought implied. In fact, that slavery was a fairly dynamic institution. It was probably capable of change. It might well have continued to exist. It certainly could have continued uh, past when it did, as evidenced by the fact that it took a pretty nasty war to stop it. So let's answer the question, then, why doesn't slavery collapse? Um, and and you ask, besides the argument that I'm going to make a little bit later about the dynamism of, uh, of slavery, there are also problems with the assumptions that our 18th century Enlightenment view had. Uh, the main one is that the geography really wasn't very well constrained. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793, that's that, the cotton gin looks like. It's a crank with some teeth that face the opposite directions and separate the seeds from the fluffy part of, of a kind of cotton called short staple cotton. Um, the short staple cotton uh, was different from the long staple. Long staple cotton you could already use, it was pretty easy to get the seeds out, so you could, you could make cloth out of that. But short staple cotton was not economical to use until the cotton gin came along. When it did, it turned out that the U.S. South had the tremendous potential for growing short staple cotton. And the fact that you could separate the fluffy part, which was important from the seeds, which were not, meant that there was a, a lot of potential for making money growing cotton, and growing cotton in particular with slave labor. The Industrial Revolution takes off about this time. By 1858, even the of the Civil War, the U.S. South supplied 81% of British cotton imports. And that is a lot of cotton. Consequently, the market price of slaves rose from something like 400 to something like $3,000 in, um, in a half a century. And of course, this is all very bad, bad timing for Native Americans because the land that turns out to be great for growing cotton is, of course, inhabited by Native Americans at this time. Um, what this plot shows is it's just a simple way of, of looking at, at the argument about slave dynamism, whether, whether slave ownership or the slave economy can actually adapt. And what I want to claim uh, with a certain amount of hand-waving is that the, the fact that the red bars here, which indicate cotton production, are rising much faster than the blue bars here, which are um, slave population, implies that you're growing more cotton with fewer and fewer slaves. So there's a, a labor productivity, an increase in labor productivity. Now, some of this could be transferring slaves from other pursuits into, into cotton. But at least by the 1850s and 1860s, the vast majority of slaves are, are in the cotton business. So I think there's something to it, um, but it's a little, it's a little crude to, to run a publication with that. Still, there's some, it suggests, suggests that, that there is a certain, um, that technological 
are happening, even in agriculture at this time, which kind of lines up with some of Wilhelm Engerman's point. Uh, all right, I think we'll can summarize this pretty, pretty quickly, that cotton is a great crop for slavery and a great crop for the South. And, and these are basically the, the, the thinking reasons for it, uh, which you can look at later. Basically, the South is warm year-round. It gets a lot of rain. Those are the things that, that cotton needs. Not a lot of other places have that kind of, uh, that kind of weather. Okay. There's a separate line, uh, which is forgotten what parallel that is. But there's a line below south of which you can grow cotton and north of which you can't. And you can see that north of that line are the Chesapeake regions. Uh, this is a slave population in the 1830s, which went still a substantial amount of cotton. Um, there's the more important uh, migration then. Well, let me back backtrack a, a little bit. In the Fogel Engerman reading, so that I don't have to quite rehearse the whole thing, he mentions that the numbers of slaves that move from this Chesapeake region into the into the cotton south. It's about 800,000, quite a lot, out of a population of uh, some 4 million or so at the, at the time of the Civil War. Roughly 800,000 slaves will move. And the reason is all the cotton. It's the opening up of this territory to cotton cultivation. Now, at this point, these areas are all Indian. Well, they're, not, uh, they're not caught up into counties yet, because they are. They're, they're Indian lands. There's a lot of, uh, as a, at the same time as this happens in the 1830s and 1840s, uh, the Indians, particularly Cherokees, tried to move from Georgia out to this remote area over here by the food and beverage prohibited sign of uh, Oklahoma. Uh, so this is a, a massive, two massive migrations are, are, are engendered by, by the cotton trade. So this very large migration of slaves, as well as the um, migration of Indian, of Native Americans uh, further west to make room for, for cotton growing. Um, by, let's see, by 1860, you can see that all those areas are filled in. And the places where cotton grows best are, are, the, are the most densely populated with uh, slaves. Um, it is worth mentioning that sugar is also grown. In the U.S. it's also a slave crop, but it's quite minor compared to, compared to tobacco. I'm sorry, compared to, to cotton. And it's grown pretty much only in Louisiana. One of the interesting reasons for that is that the Second Republic in the Western Hemisphere, does anyone know what the Second Republic? The U.S. was the First Republic other than the, in the Western Hemisphere. Who knows what the second one was? Right. Imaginary chocolate. Yes, very good. It is Haiti, um, also known as Saint-Domingue at the time. It was a French possession. It was a slave, um, a slave plantation island with a very vast majority of the population was enslaved. And it's the only place in history where a slave revolt was successful. Um, after the Haitian Revolution, which was 1790, some of the slave owners escaped with their slaves to New Orleans and took up slave, uh, sugar, sugar planting up in this, uh, at the bottom of the Mississippi River. At this point, it was still a, it was a French possession, but it would become a United States possession after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. So there's some sugar being grown up here near, near New Orleans. It's very different from, from cotton. It's not a, a cotton is kind of a family crop, as we pointed out. Women, children are all useful in cotton plantations. In the sugar plantation, it is mainly men. Um, simply the kind of work that's, that's done is, is, um, is I guess, heavier. Uh, there's not a, as wide a variety of tasks to be performed, so that's much more male dominated. And this, and this is reflected in the population of the Sugar Islands. And one of the main, one of the important reasons why the population of the Sugar Islands don't grow is the population of the Sugar Islands need constant replenishment of new, uh, new arrivals from, from Africa, whereas in the cotton south, there's natural population increase. Okay, so I guess that's a better slide talking about sugar. But um, so let's let me just finish with um, Fogel and Engerman. Okay, so here's, here's my summary of what Vogel and Engerman have, have said about it. When you read this, if you haven't read it yet, um, their point for the purpose of the lab has to do with the conditions under which slaves migrated from the Old South to the New South. The central question being this one. Um, well, follows from this, from this point. The, the Vogel and Engerman's answer is, is that that migration was not hostile to families. Right? Slave families were held, um, were, were not damaged by slave migration. And they do some, some fancy analysis to find that, and that's the stuff we're going to check. We're going to do the calculations that they do. We're going to do different calculations from what they do, and we come to either the same conclusion or a different one. We're going to use census data. They used data, uh, they used census data as well as data from, um, from slave market in New Orleans. But their broader point was this. Well, said, slavery's bad. Um, nobody's saying slavery wasn't bad. But Fogel and Engerman are making the point that slavery is not as bad as you thought. Um, particularly, it wasn't bad for families, uh, because their point of view was with, is that slavery was economically rational. It was economically rational because it worked. It was profitable. Um, they claim it was more 35% more efficient. Uh, there's some debate about what efficient means, how they calculated it. But still, th th there were numbers there that they could come to find that, that slavery made more sense. They thought um, that the slave income, to put it in quotes, that is what slaves consumed, was maybe more than they would have received as, as free workers. Right? And part of the reason, or a big part of the reason, was paternalism. Um, Fogel and Engerman believed that slave owners were paternalist, that they, since they owned the slaves, it was not in their interest to abuse them. If you own a piece of property, you're going to take care of it. And they believed that slave owners, being rational capitalists, and also Victorian in their thinking, would have respected slave families and would have organized their plantations so as to um, work to the best interest both of slaves and slave owners. Right? I have this quote from them. We do not mean to suggest that planters view the slave family as purely a business investment. Victorian attitudes predominated in the planting class. The emphasis on strong, stable families and on the limitation of sexual activity in the family followed naturally from such attitudes. That morality and good business practice should coincide created neither surprise nor consternation among most planters. So you get the sense that they, they're not saying slavery is good. They're just saying that a rational economic slave owner would not have been, um, would, would not have punished their slaves suboptimally, for example. 
impact. They would have used rewards. Uh, they would have used hierarchy. They would have used families um, for their own, for the good of, of profit. But that would have also been good for, for slave families. All, all these arguments indicate that slave labor could be implemented there. All these arguments, indeed, um, that's exactly right. All these arguments lead to the direction that, that slave labor could, in fact, compete even in a complicated um, industrial economy. And indeed, um, there are, many historians would, would say that that is, in fact, true. And this is one of this is Fogel and Engerman's real contribution, is to reassess that aspect of slavery. Now, I think Fogel and have a point in the big picture at slavery, not because it was necessarily nice. That's, a, that's a somewhat of a side question. The question is whether, whether slavery was sufficiently dynamic and sufficiently flexible to be used in an industrial economy. It's evidence that it was. Right? And Fogel and Engerman point in that direction in 1974 with this book. In 1992, Robert Fogel got the Nobel Prize for that, that and other things. Um, nonetheless, one of the arguments that they hold up is this protection of the slave family. In the lab that we're doing, we're going to take a, take a close look at that. We may not come to the same conclusion as he did. Right. One more thing. In 1974, when this book was published, this idea is, is explosive. Uh, Fogel and Engerman on the cover of Time magazine. And uh, there was a lot of anger generated by this because the implication is that the state of black families in the 1970s had nothing to do with slavery. So this is also an example of how history affects, uh, affects the present. Although he's talking about something 150 years prior, in the 1970s, this makes, makes a big statement. It has, it has an implication. It still has an implication today, which we believe this or not. But in the 1970s, possibly explosive. Yes? Um, what were the different families? Were these like the new families, like parents and siblings? Or that was like mm -hmm. grandparents, uncles? Yeah. You can take it as the whole kinship network. The, the notion is that if nobody ever sells a slave, then a plantation is going to have a whole, a whole kinship there. And there's a little roundup error, and people, slaves might marry across the fence, you know, who knows. But, but um, for the most part, the whole kinship would be on one plantation. You pick up a whole plantation and move it, then the whole, all that kinship is intact. If instead you sell one at a time, then you're yanking people from their entire kinship network, and it's, and it's a much more horrible experience. Okay, thank you.